Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will start today's episode where we'll be talking to one Dante Camacho. Dante is the founder of Dante Dog Works. He focuses on teaching other dog trainers and dog owners worldwide how to train and live with dogs using positive reinforcement based training successfully. He started his dog training career in the late 90s and was one of the first dog trainers to introduce clicker training in Brazil. Dante is an international presenter and a dog sports enthusiast, having represented Brazil and Canada in multiple world dog agility sorry world agility competitions titled dogs in rally obedience and dock diving taught and performed dog dancing for almost a decade in canada and the u.s and in recent years developed an online dog training platform that offers multiple courses for his brazilian audience he's a teacher for the animal behavior and welfare post grad course at the unirp university and since 2020, Dante has worked as a volunteer developing training programs and training staff at the Rio Preto, I'll get Dante to pronounce that correctly, Zoo. <laughs> so without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Dante to the show today, who's patiently waiting by. Dante, thanks so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thank you, Ryan, for inviting me to, to this talk. Uh, to this chat and uh, I'm very pleased to actually have uh, met you even though it's still online but uh, um, it's a pleasure I've followed um, Animal Training Academy and the stuff that you guys do and I really appreciate all the content that you share Um, yeah I'm really glad to be here awesome well uh, it's a pleasure to meet you as well albeit online and uh, very grateful for that uh, positive feedback and and for you checking out uh, what we've been up to for the past six seven years Uh, and i'm thrilled not only to be able to bring uh, stories and uh, offerings from your great experience uh, dog dancing for a decade that's so cool can't wait to uh, hear about your experience there and, and all of the other great sports uh, and things that you do uh, but also just thrilled to to hear about uh, what it's like to train in Brazil we we haven't uh, had a huge amount of guests unfortunately uh, from your corner of the globe uh, and it, it makes me excited to uh, have someone representing Brazil representing South America and singing the same song that we're singing here in New Zealand uh, and, and people are singing in the US uh, and, and the UK and, and Australia. So yeah, just thrilled to have you here for all of those reasons. Uh, on, the, on that note, let, let's get started, Dante. I want, I want to hear your story. Okay. Can, you, can you take us back and share with the listeners of the show your story, where you got started, where you first started to get into and, and learn about animal training and positive reinforcement? Um. Uh, thank you, Ryan. It's um, probably a little different from most people, people that work with uh, with dog training or animal training in general. Um, I didn't start until my early twenties, um, so I didn't. I, I did have dogs as a kid, but I was never really close. Uh, we never actually had dogs for very long. 
Um, my parents would get a dog and they, they would say, okay, you kids, you have to take care of the dog. You have to do all this stuff. And of course we were kids. We didn't. <laughs> so my parents would get rid of the dog. So that went like two or three times. And then um, when I was uh, 20, probably around that time, I actually uh, had a girlfriend that had two dogs. I actually had one dog at the time. And um, so we started dating and then I just found myself with that <laughs> animal there. <laughs> I didn't really know much about. It was a young uh, Labrador, black lab. It was probably about seven months old. And the first time I saw that dog, she was coming to meet me. Um, and she had that dog on the leash dragging her coming towards me and the dog was obviously very excited coming towards me and I was so scared because I thought it was like some sort of Rottweiler or something trying to attack me and it was just a friendly puppy and um, but that was my the extent of my um, knowledge on dogs and I knew really nothing about dog training but through you know being around that dog we very quickly realized that we needed to, you know, get some sort of communication and control over the situation with the dog. Uh, it was a very good dog, but obviously big and, you know, boisterous and didn't know what, you know, anything. So it would jump up on people and steal stuff from the house. And um, so I started looking into um, dog training at the time, looking for books and there was like, because I did, I wasn't involved in the world of dog training. I didn't really know anywhere else to look for. Um, so, but luckily I went through books first and internet was something new. People were not really, um, didn't really have much access to that. I didn't have internet at home, but I was going to college at the time and there was internet there. There was an internet room. Um, so I went um, to the internet to look for information and luckily, I found um, information that led me towards um, positive dog training or positive based uh, dog training. And um, also some of the stuff that I found in Brazil, you know, and even uh, books from Brazilian authors um, helped me understand a little bit more what was, um, what was possible with dogs. I actually did go to the kennel club to look for um, dog training, you know, like opportunities. They did have some stuff that they did, but uh, I went once and I saw that like it didn't really make much sense to me the way they were doing things. It was still just a basic traditional group class. We, you know, just walk around, stop, jerk the dog, get to sit and all this stuff. But when I saw that, I was already uh, clicker training my dogs. And uh, so it, to me, it seemed much easier <laughs> what, what I was doing than what they were doing. Um, and then, yeah, that was the first dog, uh, like the first time I actually had or tried to communicate with a dog through training. And it apparently it worked because then the neighbors started asking me to help them <laughs> with their dogs. So just from, you know, walking the dog around and teaching it not to run out of the, the house when you open the door. And, and then I, it, it just felt really good doing that. Uh, I felt like um, it was sort of not, not necessarily a job at the time, but a hobby that I truly and thoroughly enjoyed. So... I just started you know, getting more and more involved and got the chance to do um, to be a trainee with a group of trainers. And through that, then, you know, everything else just happened. I just got more into dogs, got another dog and especially got involved into in dog sports. Dog agility was my first sport. And from then, um, just things just evolved. So who was the first person or the first book or the first <coughs> course that you learned from? Who? Where did you find information about clicker training in Brazil at that time? Because you said you were doing it before you went to the kennel club already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, there was a book from a uh, Brazilian author. Uh, his name is Alex Alexander, you would say, Alexandre uh, Rossi. And uh, he had this book, was called Smart Training. And he, you know, had a bunch of different things that some some of the things I wouldn't uh, use today. But one of the things he brought um, that was new was the idea of clicker chain. What what it was? Uh, there were no clickers. People didn't know what clicker were. Uh, clickers were we just clicked with our mouth. We just, you know, like many people do. 
Um, but that was the first time I heard about it. And then once knowing about that, knowing that that existed, we uh, I went to the internet and started looking up at anything clicker. Right? But then we did get, um, I did get Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog. And there was a dog, uh, I can't remember the author, I think it's Morgan something, uh, a dog trainer um, that had a book on uh, clicker training for obedience or something like that. Maybe that was the title. Um, I forget his name. I think Morgan was uh, first name. And anyways, so I, and, and it was quite technical actually, because we didn't know what obedience was like competitive obedience. So a bunch of the stuff there didn't make that much sense to me, but I understood uh, uh, basically the concept of using clicker uh, and markers to to reinforce behavior and communicate with the dogs. But uh, as far as international books, probably Don't Shoot the Dog was um, the first one. And because it was so hard to access at the time, we did something that we uh, that was probably illegal at the time. But we made copies and we we bought the book like as a group, uh, like four or five trainers. And then one person got the book, and then we made you know like Xerox Xerox copies and shared between uh, the trainers so that everybody could have a, a copy and, and read it. But that was what we could do 20-something years ago. Um, well, it wasn't that you got your hands on, on Don't Shoot the Dogs. There was there was a group of you. You managed to find some other yeah. people locally who were, who were interested in exploring this new information uh, collectively, yeah. which must have been really helpful, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Three or four trainers that, you know, understood and followed, you know, the same ideas. And uh, we worked together for a little while. And um, but unfortunately, none of them actually got involved in um, sports or more competitive training. So that route I had to take by myself, like venture into that. Uh, that was totally uncharted territory for positive uh, training, uh, dog training in Brazil still at, at that time. I feel I feel like I've heard the name Alexander Rossi before. Yeah, probably because he's um, he's quite popular as a train. He had like it was like on a TV show here uh, for many years. So um, probably one of the most prominent um, dog trainers in the country. And so you you found Alexander. You and yeah, sad. it was totally, totally out of luck. Like my girlfriend knew someone that worked with him and I didn't even know he existed. And then and it was like, oh, there's someone, a friend of mine is doing some dog training. And I'm like, okay. And then, yeah, it just happened. I was lucky that way. So, so you actually, you actually met him rather than started to yeah, consume yeah. his content. Ah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, um, I heard about that, you know, the fact that they were doing some training and it was like really close to where I, my girlfriend lived. And so we, we met, I actually read, no, I read his book before I met him, but I read his book like in two days. It was like, I was so addicted to like, training. I, could, I couldn't stop continuing and reading stuff. I went to the local library. I, had, I read every single book on dogs and dog training there, were, there was available. So was it in your, in your nature to find a new topic and go to the library and read everything? Or, or was the, the dog training uh, inspire you and, and you found yourself maybe exploring a topic more than you would another topic that came your way? Yeah, totally. Like it was totally new. I had never done anything like that. I was never that interested about something. You know, the dog training just made me feel, and it's not that I didn't have any other, you know, like hobbies or didn't do other stuff, but um, that was something that I really felt passionate about. And I think just like in any training, I felt very successful right at the beginning. So <laughs> that I was reinforced very uh, early in the process by seeing things work and, you know, like actually getting reactions from dogs immediately. So that definitely must have had a, a, an effect. And then um, I just knew that I, that there should be much more in it, like to learn. So yeah, I, I had only gone to the library before if I had to for school, <laughs> but never for anything different. So what, what what was the name of your girlfriend at the time's dog? 
Ziggy. Ziggy. Actually, yeah, we called him Ziggy, but it's from Siggy, Sigmund Freud. Right. That's why. <laughs> He's a black lab. And uh, he was an amazing dog. And, like, it, he was, you know, like a regular lab. But we were so naive as far as, you know, understanding about dog training. I was thinking about that earlier today. Um, she had a prong collar on him when I first uh, met him. It was like really large, right? It was like not fitted for the dog. It was just something she found at a pet store and, you know, probably someone told her she should buy it because it was good for her dog. We were so naive that I actually thought that a prong collar was to be worn inside out so that the prongs were outside and to look um, mean, like, you know, like those collars that have nails. <laughs> That's how I thought the, the prong should be, should be worn because I had no idea that that was actually a tool, a training tool with the purpose, you know, like, it was, uh, that's how my, my, the extent of not only mine, but her knowledge, my girlfriend's knowledge at the time as well on, you know, training and, and yeah, basically training. Well, I feel that's a pretty good use for a prong collar in, in my personal opinion. <laughs> uh, you, you, yeah. you, you said you got... I don't think even for that, it, it does well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine it's got some uh, cons to hitting yeah. things and, and being irritable to the dog. Uh, you, yeah. you said that you were reinforced by that, that early success. What what did you do with, with Ziggy, <laughs> Sigmund? Uh, they, they got them. They got your neighbor's attention, and how did you? How did you kind of approach that problem with that new knowledge and paired with that uh, freshness to this knowledge? Um, as far as you know, teaching stuff, um, it was just the very basic of you know, look at me sitting was like very basic sitting, and especially, and that's probably what caught people's attention was the fact that we uh, I taught him to wait while we opened the gate so the car could go and come into the garage. So then the neighbors, they had dogs and they're like, oh, I want to be able to do that too. Right? And so I guess that's basically, and you know, not jumping up when people come in, my, uh, my girlfriend's parents, uh, they were very happy about that too. So, but that the neighbors didn't see much of that. What the neighbors actually saw mostly was the whole, you know, wait and not take off out in the street um, when we opened the gate, when we were coming in with the car. So that's probably what uh, my, the advertisement, what people saw that actually got them interested. I'm curi curious if that second book was, was Morton? Morgan something. It was Morgan. It wasn't Morton. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking Morton yeah. next bit from... Norway, from Sweden, uh, Norway, no, yeah, Norway, yeah, yeah. No, um, no, Morgan Specht or something like that. It, oh, was, yeah. it was an, it's an American. Was that? Yeah. It? You, you said it, at that time, so you, you, you trained Sigmund, and your neighbors started to take notice. Uh, and it wasn't really a job at the time, but a hobby. So did you did you then, as a hobby, uh, find agility and start getting into dog sports? Yeah, yeah. Still at that time, actually, one of those visits that I. Um, took to the kennel club training that I told you it was that wasn't really uh, something that interested me. They actually were doing some. Um, um, they were showing some different kinds of training. So they were showing like showing dogs for you know like um, for show really just show the dog stand there and all that obedience and also some agility. Someone took brought some uh, jumps and a tire and a wee set of wee poles and they were doing like some demos at the park. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is really, really cool. And um, I really got interested in doing that. And um, But at the time, I couldn't do that with uh, Siggy because actually Siggy had um, quite severe hip dysplasia. Eventually, we found out. But then by then, I was so involved that I actually got another dog. And um, we just got a dog because we thought it was cute. It was a Scottish Terrier. <laughs> and I decided that I would do agility with the Scottish Terrier. And that's what I did. Um, we, I, I found out about agility. That was the only dog I had. I, you know, I saw all these people with Border Collies. They were flying and going so fast and doing all these things. 
and I had this cottage area. So I like, yeah, okay, I'll just try with her. So I did some PVC, made up some PVC jumps and started, bought like a cat tunnel. I would have it open in my apartment. It was really a small apartment I lived at the time. So the dog would have to go through the tunnel every time he went from the kitchen to the living room (laughs) because the tunnel was just sitting there. Anyways, um, yeah, so I got involved. uh, It was starting already to become something I would do uh, as a profession. But at the time, I still went to college. I was going to college to go to become a teacher. Portuguese and English teacher. That was my goal. So I was starting and I like to do some of this and some of that. Eventually, of course, I I left school and became a full-time dog person, nerd, trainer, (laughs) everything. Well, I guess you did end up becoming a teacher just of different information. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And maybe not the species you thought you would be teaching, although you obviously work with humans mostly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that, I couldn't run away from that. <laughs> so, so how did that evolve to ending up finding yourself in, in Canada? Was that ever part of the plan? No. Oh, it eventually became. Um, I actually went and started um, doing agility and eventually competing. Um, I knew there were limitations to my uh, to what I could reach with my dog if I wanted to really, you know, be competitive. So um, my Scotty actually did really well for like what she could do. And um, I mean, just physically what a dog of that size and, you know, built uh, could do. But then eventually I realized I needed to have uh, another dog if I wanted to compete and do uh, agility more competitively. And then I did end up uh, getting a border collie. Um that didn't really turn out the way I wanted because she actually had this temper at the very, uh, when I got her, she came with this temper, I believe. So she had a bunch of issues and then she had a femur fracture at four months old. So she, it wasn't really a, a, an agility prospect. So I, I still was like very interested. I still want to do this. So I got, I adopted a uh, Sheltie, it was about a year old and um so with that dog, I ended up uh, competing for Brazil, winning Brazilian championship, South American championship, and competing uh, overseas, like at world's com- world competitions. And I think we did, we went to four different world competitions. And through those competitions, I ended up meeting a bunch of people from other countries and uh, a bunch of people from Canada, and they invited me to come over to teach. So I went there to teach a couple of workshops one year, competed at a a regional competition. And then the following year, they invited me again. And I, yeah, I said, yeah, I'll go. And I went and competed regionally. And then I decided I would stay a couple more months so I would compete for the nationals. And then eventually, uh, by then, I was actually seeing someone and I decided, okay, I might just stay a little longer. And things just happened in a way that I just uh, I could just stay there, and it was actually quite easy. Um, I actually had a friend that was uh, moving to England from Brazil, and she had a couple of dogs that she had to quarantine because she was going to England from Brazil. Uh, she didn't want to quarantine them in England because they would have to stay somewhere she didn't know and all that, but they could be quarantined in Canada. So she just sent me the dogs and I stayed there for the, all the period that those dogs had to be quarantined. So I was there like between paperwork and all that about eight, nine months just taking care of our dogs. So it was like quite um, a good deal. I just stayed there and, you know, like got paid to be with these dogs and my dogs and play and go to a park every day and do training and all of that. So and by then I was I'm pretty much um, living in Canada. So the two competitions that were the initial reasons ended up becoming like nine years living in Canada. I've spent some time in Canada, so I can appreciate uh, the the attraction and, and the reinforcers available. And, and uh, they, they're a huge country. I mean, you might have been living uh, in one part of Canada that's completely different to where I was because it's so large. Uh, what what is it about the the competitive side that that is, that appealed to you uh, or that appeals to you now? Is it the same thing that appealed to you back then? What is it about competition that drew you in? Um, I think 
at the very beginning, I had um, the idea that I should probably prove something as well, especially here in Brazil in the beginning, because um, because I was the only person that was using um, positive uh, training and I was using the clicker. And there was a lot of uh, pushback in the beginning. People didn't really want to know or they actually uh, labeled you as, you know, you, you you have no idea what you're doing and this is not, this doesn't work. And this is, you know, um, just, I, I, and I knew the results that I had gotten and I knew what, um, what we could achieve. Uh, so I think in the beginning, there was that idea that, you know, like I can do this and I can show everyone that this can be done. Um, eventually, once that was over, because then everybody saw, yeah, this works. And, and you know, I was not the only person doing that anymore, uh, but especially people from overseas. Once you, you see, they were, they were also doing that. Uh, I think it became um, just the challenge of each um, goal that you set next, you know, like, okay, um, I want to be able to run with the fastest dogs. Okay, I'm there. I want to be able to go compete overseas. Okay, I can do that now. And, you know, like knowing uh, my limitations, I knew that I wanted to get the most uh, out of my training and my dogs, uh, the most I could get. So until that, until I felt comfortable that I had achieved that, um, that gave me you know, the motivation to just keep pushing, keep um, going. Um, today, I mostly do for the fun of training. I am not as um, as motivated to compete anymore, but I'm very motivated to train because I know that if I can train and I can teach and I can do the things that I, um, I want to do, um, it's enough for me knowing that I don't have to really think of proving to anyone or reaching some... Um, I, I think I've achieved the things I wanted in the sport. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that I'll never compete again. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I am training a dog uh, as of right now. But I'm, I'm, uh, there's no rush anymore. It's not like, oh, that's not the final goal. You know, final goal is just to, and, you know, it's not just like have fun. Of course, have fun is part of the process. But it's the whole idea of, you know, being or doing the best I can. And me knowing that. Um, that today motivates me enough to keep training uh, my dogs in multiple sports and doing multiple things. I was going to ask what led to that success early on, and, and I get the feeling that it was uh, your your approach, which included positive reinforcement and clicker training, which you suggested was different at the time. And, and I was curious if you got pushback uh, being quite novel uh, information uh, and practice in, in, in your region. But it, it seems like uh, you've been a bit of a, a ripple maker, a bit of a um, leader in bringing this information, a bit of a change maker. Is that, does, does, how does it feel me saying these things about you? Is that how you see yourself? Is that, that's, that's something that I'm interpreting was your, was your motivation? Mm, maybe, yeah. I think um, I didn't really think about that before, but I, I think that especially thinking back of how many times I actually taught people and places I went teach about clicker training, I think there was a motivation to actually spread this information and get people to understand what was happening. I never felt uh, like some people do, like they feel bad if people choose to do something else. I just felt that I that people should at least understand what's happening. And and then, of course, they can make their choices later. But um, I think I never thought it as like, oh, this is my purpose. <laughs> I have to, you know, carry the flag of positive reinforcement. No, I just, you know, look, there's this tool here. This works. This is what I'm doing. You know, like it's not... Uh, magic but it's not uh, and it's not a lie it's not luck and this is what it is you know and I, I'm I feel a little bit responsible today for where the sport is now for where people what people do today at least here because I know that in, in some way at least a little bit I was able to influence uh, a couple of heads a couple of people to you know look at least take a second look and um, look for other options. 
not that I'm not very romantic in the sense that oh, people are understanding that positive reinforcement is the is the best way to go. Now, I do believe people still were looking for what worked best. They were looking for results, and that's the main reason why they came to me to ask for workshops or work, you know, like or teach about um, uh, clicker training because they saw results. They saw things happening. They saw changes in other people's uh, dogs. And they wanted that, right? But it doesn't matter if that's the way. Uh, if it gets people to to do things differently, then it's a win, in my in my opinion. And is this is this wise twenty twenty two Dante? If we ask the same questions to nineteen nineties <laughs> Dante, would he have said the same thing? I mean, I, I am saying this from a place of ignorance, not knowing uh, much about positive reinforcement training, its it's infiltration into culture uh, and its uh, predominance or non-predominance versus other um, tools in, in your in your country and in your part of the world. But I, but I do know that uh, even in, in Western countries and places like uh, New Zealand or US, there's trainers who are implementing positive reinforcement and in their local area, they might have a lot of trainers pushing back on them. Uh, and I know a lot of people find this really hard, like it's really challenging to be that person advocating uh, for a tool uh, and, and using a tool when people are judging you. Uh, has this mindset that you've um, shared with us just now, is, is, that, is that something you've carried through your entire career or, or is it something that's ripened with age? Um, I think both. I think it, you carry it, but it changes slightly and the way you, you, you see it also changes a little bit. But it's mostly because um, you, I think, as I said, as you age, you understand a little bit more about people and where they're coming from. So, you know, nothing else changes like training and, you know, my opinion about, but you just, you become a little bit more empathetic to you know where people are coming from um, but it, it can be challenging um to a lot of people and as you said it, it, it's not different in brazil you know there's people trying to implement more positive training and of course there's pushback uh it's totally different from 20 years ago but uh, there's much more people you know invested in understanding and, and learning and teaching about positive training but uh, there is still, of course, uh, a lot of pushback. And I think there's, uh, and maybe that's a global phenomena that, you know, people are sort of divided in groups and especially like two main groups. So oh, I do, I teach or I train positively and you don't. So you are bad or you're good or you work, you don't work and, and this stuff. Um, I think that did happen eventually and, and it's very much like that here today but it wasn't so much at that time just because there was no other side there was just one side right it was just one person bringing this new like idea or concept um but i try to stay let's say as you mentioned being wiser i try to stay out of you know this kind of separation or discussion about our judgment about who is good or bad and and what they're doing in training and still my main focus is i guess that's what didn't change is to share and spread information that will um, help people and will actually give what they're looking for that's efficiency efficacy and then i just add the ethics in there <laughs> So what was you did you lived in the US as well or you just spent some time in the US? No. We just went through the US a, a few times when I was in uh in Canada cuz I did travel a lot with a dog show called Super Dogs. So we actually traveled all across Canada doing shows. So um that's where like I showed my dogs in like performances like obedience performances or um racing and it was like an entertainment show thing so that's where i did a lot of my freestyle dancing and so some of the shows we actually went to the u.s to show and these shows would last you know from three four days to three weeks sometimes 
would just be out there with the dogs at a, some fair in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and I was showing our dogs every day and playing with the dogs. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun. But that's how I ended up, you know, um, in many different places. Um, I lived in one place, in, in a couple of places in Canada, but I ended up traveling almost the whole country doing dog stuff. It does sound like a, a lot of fun. And, and you ended up, uh, I think I saw photos of you at Clicker Expo. Uh, what, what were some yeah. of the, what were some of the pivotal learning moments or learning opportunities or, or people you met uh, during your time in North America? In North America, um, there's a lot of people, of course, that made a lot of difference in my career and you know my, my learning. But if I was to say a name that at least people will, will in general will recognize, it's probably going to be Terry Ryan. Um, I did go to a chicken camp in Calgary where I lived at the time. And I was uh, I, I, like, I already wanted to, to, to go to a chicken camp for many years. I just had never had the chance. And then this one happened at the Calgary Humane Society. They were hosting it. And so I went to the camp. It was, I don't know, I think it was a long camp, maybe six or eight days. And that definitely changed a lot to me. And, and actually, I was through that opportunity. I actually developed a friendship with uh, Terry. I invited her. She's been to Brazil maybe four or five times. And, um, but she, like that, that workshop definitely revitalized my training, <laughs> like mojo even, because it just, you know, showed me so many um, different things and, you know, processes, because I was just training dogs until then. And so when we got with the chickens, I was just you know, um, really, uh, really into it. We are big Terry Ryan fans here at Animal Training Academy. And, and come to think about it, Ter Terry Ryan's done a class for our Animal Training Academy premium members. And she shared some videos. And I'm, I, you know, I think that you might actually be on one of those videos on a, in, in a class within our membership. I, I, that, 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 as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, Dante, I've seen Dante and Terry before. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And so you learn you learn about training chickens, uh, and I know Terry does this uh, her little mini chicken agility <laughs> course on the table. Yes. Um, and so and so you started to expand your appreciation uh, or your understanding of the universality of positive reinforcement between species. Had you, had yeah, you thought about I, that? Before? I I had thought about it because I knew that clicker training had come from other species from the use, you know, in wild animals and, you know, like the dolphins and whales and all that. So um, that wasn't a surprise to me. What actually made, what had a bigger impact was how uh, organized and uh, systematic the training could be. Because until then, as a dog trainer, it was a lot, you know, okay, we use positive reinforcement, but we go a lot by feel. Right. And so understanding all the processes, all, you know, like all those forms and stuff. Oh, you have to observe the animal, you do this and you count them, the amount of reinforcers and you count the time and all of that. So that was all new. Um, and even the process, you know, of understanding how to teach the basic concepts of discrimination and all of that. And um, that was um, that, that had a big impact. Um, as I said, I, like my first workshop, I was maybe 20 minutes away from my home. So I would go home for lunch and I couldn't even wait to get home to like, try do stuff with my dogs and then go back and go watch the, the chicken. But yeah, implementing all of that just um, made my training just, you know, change like the level of training that I was uh, applying with my dogs um so yeah and it, it from then on it that just kept uh, evolving in that sense you know becoming more and more professional in that way you know and i think uh, um, uh, most dog training that you learn or you know, if you go to schools any school to learn about dog training um it it's not that um specific as far as in you know, understanding the science we understand the science of behavior, but the science of the training, I don't think there's as much 
uh, emphasis uh, on it as you would find in a um, chicken camp workshop or um, of course, there are some courses that are more uh, that, that are a little bit more um, focused a little more on that. But in general, if you talk about dog training, it's more. I think we, there's a lot of uh, etology involved, and um, you know, just general uh, understanding of training, not very specific. And is that is that what you're finding with your clients in Brazil that they they're coming to you with their previous learning and their reinforcement history and everything they've done with dogs? Uh, are they are they bringing that ethology perspective? And then you're adding is 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 that what you're finding in Brazil? How 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 is how are your how is the the scene? How is the um, what what would you say is the general consensus about working with dogs and, and behavior uh, in your country and with the clients that come to you and and <clears throat> i guess you should specify are the clients that come to you with your online program and, and your in-person stuff professionals are professionals seeking you out to get help or are they are you working more with people and dogs jumping at you when they come at the door and reactivity like both yeah um mostly professionals that's who i work with today um, so the information I get is the people that look for them, right? And what they're looking for. And I think uh, even the professionals are looking for a greater understanding of the use of science to modify behavior, especially. Um, the idea of you know understanding dogs and dog behavior and dog relationship, um, uh, looking through a more ethological lens or i would say it's not not even that looking more through a um, human lens i think it's still prevalent even in professionals because i find myself uh constantly also having to remind people of the ethological aspect of behavior so uh, i think um, in general at least you know my students and people that are especially coming new into this world and trying to learn about dog training they do understand that there there is the option of um, more friendly and positive training but uh, i think the influence that media has over um, the general consensus or idea of, of relationship with dogs and dog behavior is it's still uh, very strong that idea you know that um, dogs are not people, but we should expect them to um, understand and see things like we want them to. So it's not even ethological. It's just, you know, like the, the way. And that, I believe, has a, a, an element of a cultural element as well, because of how people, uh, how we relate to dogs as, as a culture. Um, uh, of course, I can talk about my bubble. That's obviously not the whole of Brazil, but if I think in more openly about how people in general uh, relate to dogs, um, dogs are a very present part of uh, Brazilian lives. You know, like a lot of people have dogs and I don't, I can't remember the numbers, but it's like, I know Brazilian pet market is the second largest, just a second to the, to the US. So there's a lot of dogs. So dogs are very common. People have dogs, people live with dogs, and they have done this for many, many decades and probably centuries. So the way they relate to dogs is basically, you know, like, yeah, dogs are present, dogs are there, that's the, that's the dog. That's what dogs do, or, or that's, I don't want the dog to do that. And then, you know, it's very, um, it's, it's very natural. Just there's, there's not really, it's, there's not a romantic view of the dog like we you know you would see in the, the new owner dog owner that has never had a dog and is trying to understand how dogs are you know no dogs are there you know like yeah you see dogs on the street nobody really uh, unless you're you're involved in rescuing dogs you see dogs on the street and that's just a normal fact yeah there's dogs that live on the street or they just hang out on the street all day and that's just normal. You know, you take your dog out for a walk. Yeah, of course, there, there's going to be other dogs <laughs> out on the street. You know, that's just normal. So I think that, too, um, makes it a little bit harder for people to shift to thinking about dogs and their behavior in more scientific ways. You know? Because even if as a professional, you, can't, you cannot not be influenced 
by your everyday life, like your parents and how you grew up and everything. As a kid, for me, dogs were just there. You don't you don't mess with dogs. <laughs> they're there. If you mess with them, you might get bit. But you know, they're there. They can be next to you. You just don't care. They if you you can give them food if they want. If you're eating something, you know. But and you should be scared of some of them. <laughs> and that's that's how um, I grew up with dogs. You know, like you know, they're there. They're part. And that's I think what is interesting. They're really everywhere you go, you will see dogs. But and uh, it's it's not even seen as a, an issue in general. Of course, there is issues. There is, you know, dogs are sick and rescued and all of that. But if you talk about to the general public about dogs, if they think dogs out on the street are an issue, nobody's going to say it's an issue. It's just, no, they're just there. <laughs> and don't try, the dog catcher try to catch some of the dogs. People would just hide them in, the house, in their homes and then let them out later. <laughs> so they're just part of, you know, society mainly. So a, a very different culture than uh, what you experienced in Canada, I, I would assume. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and the people of Brazil, uh, how common is it to, to speak fluent English to, to your level? No. No. no, not in general. So, no, so you're you're teaching just on your online programs just in Portuguese. Am, am I correct? Yeah. And so, this, so a lot of dog owners are limited to the offerings that are offered in in Portuguese. Uh, and yeah. is, is there uh, a lot to choose from if you're a dog owner in Portugal and you? I'm oh, sorry, in, in Brazil, and you want to learn about positive reinforcement or just dog training? It might be a different strategy. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot today. Um, probably in the last five years, so it's, it's grown a lot because because social media, I guess, it's what made it so available for everyone. So people just go on YouTube or Google and you know find. So there's tons of people teaching and you know offering online courses and you know even um, in, like, actual trainers going to people's homes and, and working with them. There is quite a bit of uh, people doing that. Uh, maybe not in like the furthest, smaller towns. You know, like I, I do get quite a few messages of people, you know, like wanting help and not being able to find trainers that they. Um, so online content definitely is something that can help in that sense because um, we we are still mostly located in the bigger cities. People don't have as much options, at least to get a trainer to come to their home and help them um, actually being there. Um, and when we caught up last week, you mentioned to me that uh, your experience has really helped you see uh, the uni- universality of positive reinforcement to to all of these sports you've done, uh, to all of these dogs, uh, and, and that's important for you, I understand, in, in your online teachings now to, to help the professionals uh, in Brazil uh, understand the science as you've been talking about uh, and how it applies to whatever context they might be individually working in? Yeah, um, yeah, it does. It does a lot. I guess because of how I started training and um, the it's called challenges I had with my first dogs as I was trying to compete and all of that. And, you know, I, had, I first had, a, as I mentioned, a terrier. I wasn't really experienced with dogs in general and then i get a dog that has a specific temperament that you know can be quite challenging for a person that's not experienced either with dogs or with training and i decide to do a sport where that dog has to be running free you know like (laughs) next to a bunch of you know like a lot of a a lot of uh, information and stimuli around and then my next dog the one that i you know the, the one that i adopted ended up uh, when I got her, uh, got him, he was like, really, really shy, and uh, he shy to the point that he couldn't. You can look at the dog; he would run and and hide. Um, so the, the especially this dog actually came from other trainers. Um, so I knew then when I started being able to get through to the dog through um, uh, clicker training, um, I knew that there was something, and the people, you know should know that there is uh, there are other options and people can um, get stuff done. It doesn't matter if it's a dog that is very opinionated and doesn't really, you know, like has 
um, very independent and has, or a dog that's extremely shy and is scared of, you know, the wind. So um, we could use the same tool to get um, the results. So moving on like to the other stuff that I did, all the other sports, and especially like all the dog dancing when we uh, performed in quite extreme conditions, you know, with um, thousands of people and music and all that several times a day and, you know, for weeks on end and, you know, all using that same, the, the same concepts. Um, I find that it's important to share, at least for me, it's important to share with people about these experiences. And I think that's the, the, the easiest way for me to get through to people, um, to inform and to uh, share about the, that universality. I think that's the word you used uh, uh, of the training, or how you, we can apply this to. And of course, once I started, when I, once I brought chicken training to Brazil, then it became even more obvious, you know, like, okay, like chicken can learn. Um, so it, it is um, something I try to, to do on a daily basis to show that it doesn't really matter what the issue is, because normally people will look for you or look for trainers when there is an issue. It doesn't really matter what the issue is. We can still look uh, at it uh, through you know science through uh, training in that way and and it will work as long as we're you know committed and and understand what we're doing and what our goals are so, and then that i don't know if that answered your question <laughs> that, well, that mindset and that, and that thinking led to you somehow volunteering uh, and and working with a, a whole new range of species uh, at a local zoo, how, how did how did that uh, collaboration uh, eventuate? Um, so I uh, I mentioned I I teach uh, at university here. So uh, a couple of the students um, were actually from the zoo. They worked at the zoo. One was a responsible vet, and the other one was like uh, one of the managers. So once they came to my class and they learned about uh, marker training. They immediately thought, oh, I should invite you to come to the zoo because it's so fun. Of course, they had seen about training in other places, other zoos, even, you know, bigger zoos here in Brazil where they do, you know, training. But they had no idea how to start or what to do. So they invited uh, me and my wife to go for a visit. And we just thought, it, you know, maybe we could start something try, you know, maybe with one animal, see how it works. And um, it just clicked. We were able to um, actually get results with some of the, the animals they really needed help with. They had the tapirs that they, you know, constantly had issues to weigh and get blood draws and all of that. So we were able to uh, work with those animals. And today it's like a really a non-issue. It's just part of everyday uh, um, routine of the zoo to get these animals, move them from place to place and get them on the scale and get them to give blood. And it was, it's, it's just changed so much. Um, and then we just started, you know, doing this with more and more animals until we got to the point now where we are, I can't remember the number of species, but we're probably over 15 different species. Um, and some of them, we just do the training as enrichment, not necessarily because, you know, we do need them to, to learn this because of some procedure that we might do. But in some cases, uh, the benefits are uh, so notice, noticeable that we actually get the, um, the trainees, all the people that there are a bunch of students from biology courses that have to, to do some training at the zoo. So we just get all these newbies to learn about the basics about training and, you know, enrich those animals day just by teaching them targets and teaching them um, basic behaviors there. Um, can actually eventually be also useful. But um, yeah, it's it's been a, an amazing experience. I can't really see myself now not going there weekly because it's, uh, and even that, even though we like, I don't develop a, re a personal relationship with the animals also because I'm not there every day. Um, 
we do develop, you know, uh, a relationship, even if it's just on my part. <laughs> it's not like the animals see me and they're like, oh, that is here. No, <laughs> but I'm, um, that's my human, uh, not so much trainer part. Every time I go, I, you know, I'm happy to see those guys. I'm happy to see the animals and I'm happy when, you know, they get to change uh, the enclosure that they're in to a place that's better or they get to get treated because we did some training and you can, you know, the vet can check them and they're not stressed. And so that is really uh, gratifying as well. Um, and of course, it opens new opportunities as well for training. So we've been invited, you know, to help in, uh, with other animals and people are calling us to like help with horses and you know even other zoos have um invited us to visit um we can't really do everything <laughs> but it's uh it's just a new uh, a bunch of new things that um, we can do as well you might have to explain to everyone listening what a tapir is i, I assume these <laughs> members of this podcast audience that they might not be familiar <laughs> oh a tapir, if you if you think of, uh, if you look at it, um, do you know what a capybara is? <laughs> Maybe people won't know. Yeah, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure. I know what a capybara is. <laughs> I just don't know if the audience of this uh, show, without, without reaching for Google, would uh, necessarily yeah, well, have to they, come to mind quickly. They, they might have to go to Google because uh, a tapir is like a huge, huge pig that has a small elephant trunk on its face. <laughs> Do you think that description? Well, if it doesn't, <laughs> at least we'll make. It, sorry, I was just going to say, if it doesn't pique the interest of the listeners of this show, then uh, they, they think very differently than me. A huge. <laughs> no, that, that was a perfect description. And you, and you said you said the training just clicked with the zoo. I liked the pun. I don't know if that was intended, <laughs> but it was well done. Uh, and I'm curious. Uh, I know in, in some parts of the world, working in a zoo is. Uh, potentially seen as you know, bottom of the barrel type work, like you know, no one wants to work in a zoo. That's that's a great mm -hmm. job to have. And in other parts of the world, like you know, there's a, there's a lot of pride and a lot of um, uh, you know, you, it's very hard to get a job because so many people want to work in a zoo. Well, what's it like in in Brazil? And, and how did the the team there, the, the keepers, the people working on the ground, uh, respond to yeah. you coming in and? Uh that's uh, actually one of the challenges because <clears throat> as a keeper, yeah, that's not the kind of job that people are looking for. And uh, the keepers in general at the zoo uh, that we work uh, with are just, you know, regular people that were hired to clean um, animals' poop. Basically, that's it. And they, they're not educated in, in any way about the animals or training or anything. So that was one of the challenges because there's a lot of harm that had already been done because, you know, just people not knowing how to interact with these animals. And But it's interesting. I actually gave a talk a while ago for a Lemonade conference. Uh, I think it was not the last one, the, the previous one where I talked about, you know, how uh, training these animals can actually help you become a better dog trainer. And the, one of the last uh, things I talked about is how the keepers actually started changing their behavior with the animals just by watching us do the training. And actually, we have some videos of them with the tapirs because they get the brooms and we learned that the tapirs like to be brushed with brooms. So uh, we actually got them, like not, not that we asked, we actually got footage of them in there with the tapirs in the enclosure and all brushing and the tapirs like, oh, on their back and really enjoying. And you could see that they were actually enjoying it and doing it because they want it. It's not part of their job. So we like to believe that it helps um, uh, them change a little bit the, their behavior as well. But as far as um, the work, um, what we also um, realized, and it's actually uh, something we're really excited about, is that two of the students that were um, working at the zoo as trainees, because they had this uh, compulsory um, work they have to do for, for school, they actually, after they finished their, uh, their school and um, the work that they had to do that, they actually came back and were hired as zookeepers. So people that are educated and they actually not only know more about animals in general, they actually know about the training 
they actually decided that they wanted to come back and do that job. So it's something very exciting for us because that also helps change um, what the other zookeepers are doing and, you know, how in general the whole zoo is running. So, um, but as, as, as a general activity, you know, like being the zookeeper is probably not the kind of thing a kid thinks as a kid. Oh, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah. Not yet. You're, you're talking to the kid who sat there when, talking to the guy, sorry, who sat there when he was a kid <laughs> thinking that exact same thing, that that's what I wanted to do when I, when I grew up. Um, hey, <laughs> What we're going to do is, uh, when we, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of, of all of your experience and, and all that you have to offer the listeners of the show, Dante. So thank you for for sharing everything so far. We're going to we're going to wrap up, I think, uh, this this conversation uh, and, and turn it into a double episode. And, and uh, we haven't we haven't finished with you yet. I still want to extract uh, value from uh, all of this travel and all of this training and all of these species that you've worked with. Just before we do wrap up part one, though. Can you just share with everyone online uh, listening where they can go to find out more about you and get in touch and see what you're up to? Um, I think the easiest way is probably Instagram, uh, Dante Dogworks. You can actually, you can also, you know, most of my stuff is in Portuguese. If you go on YouTube and look for Dante Camacho, um, you'll find some videos of me working or playing with my dogs or competing. But most of my stuff is in Portuguese. So if you want to reach me, uh, Dante Dog Works is probably the, the easiest way you can find me on Instagram or even on TikTok. <laughs> Actually, we got a, a viral video on TikTok from the zoo. We got like over 70 million views of a main wolf taking like training. So um, people can, can find me there. And yeah, we usually are pretty good at answering uh, people. Oh, I haven't even jumped on TikTok myself yet, so maybe that'll be the catalyst, uh, the, the ripple that makes me jump on there. Well, we will, of course, link to your, your Instagram, your TikTok from our show notes. Uh, for part one, Dante, this has been so much fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, uh, thank you so much for sharing everything with us so far. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.